English Renaissance theatre, also known as early modern English theatre, refers to the theatre centre in London mainly, which occurred between 1561 and 1642, when the closure of the theatres was announced by the English Parliament. Playwrights worked in both the classic types of drama, tragedy and comedy. They also began their own type of history play, mainly about early English kings and the events of their reigns. Comedy was the main genre influenced by Romans and Greeks, mainly in subjects and settings, as well as its structure. One of the most important Italian influences was the Commedia dell'arte, which means comedy of the profession. This form of theatre was an improvised performance by wandering players. There were masks to portray a regular cast of characters and made the lines as they went along. It is the late developments of Italian drama with which English coaches and scholars came into contact. A subgenre developed in this period was the city comedy, which deals satirically with life in London after the fashion of Roman New Comedy. Examples are Thomas Decker, The Shoemaker's Holiday, and Thomas Middleton, A Chased Mine in Cheapside. Spaces like Spanish Corrales existed in England too, in years of English scenes which provided sites for public theatre and to more permanent structures were built. Moreover, in the 16th century, the popularity of Seneca's tragedies was in means. Tragedy was an amazingly popular genre. Marlowe's tragedies were exceptionally popular, such as Dr. Faustus and the Jew of Malta. The audiences particularly liked revenge dramas, such as Thomas Gates' The Spanish Tragedy. The four tragedies considered to be Shakespeare's greatest, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, were composed during this period, as well as many others. To English dramatists, struggling to impose form and order to the shapeless, though vigorous, native drama, Seneca seemed to offer an admirable model. His tragedies contained abundance of melodrama to suit the popular taste. The stage, actors and audiences. During the 16th century, the theatre finally establishes itself in England as a form of entertainment that is liked by all social levels. Everyone, apart from royalty, used to visit public theatres. The new theatres were popular and their audiences had a voracious appetite for new plays. New companies flourished and writers were employed to satisfy the demand for novelty. Between 1580 and 1642, we find more than 1,000 plays. Playwrights often work together in the same production, comedy and tragedy are often combined. In 1567, James Burbage built the first public theatre in London. By the end of the 16th century, we find eight theatres in a city of 2,100 inhabitants. Companies were hierarchical, actors who had a stake in the company were called sharers and divided up the profit among them. Harlings were just paid a weekly wage, whilst the boys who played women's roles were apprentices and played every little. Actors specialized in specific roles where they performed as part of their repertoire. The two most famous companies were the Admiral's Men and the Lord Chamberlain's Men, which were rivals. At the beginning of the 16th century, the classical renaissance of the continent starts to influence English theatre. The first adaptations of Plotus and Terence took place in the universities and other cultural centres, Westminster, Eton, St. Paul, Oxford and Cambridge. Primitive English Comedy Latin and Italian Influences during the whole Renaissance, there was a constant interest for Italy and the classic role in English theatre. By that time, this country was the main European focus of art and its influence was spread around all the continent. Furthermore, a lot of Italian immigrants arrived to England and probably some playwrights such as William Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe and especially Ben Jonson, who had even a play of plays on Venice, while Pone could make a friendship with some of these immigrants. Moreover, a lot of classical works, which had already been translated into Italian, French or Spanish, were also translated into English and read by important playwrights. A sample of this constitutes The Prince by Machiavelli. Part of the society were organizing themselves in secret, as we see in the translation of The Prince. Another example of translation are The Faithful Shipper by Battista Guarini, not to mention the most frequently translated one, The Divine Comedy by Dante. Many writers translated Petrarch's sonnets into English and also created different ones. One of the authors influenced by the classical world was Nicholas Hidor, who wrote an adaptation of Miles Curiosus by Plotus called Ralph Royce Doster. George Gascoigne wrote Sopuses based on Lisa Posity by Ariosto. Writers began to question monarchy partially because the king had created a new religion. Latin literature was another important influence on Renaissance English literature. The Renaissance stories could have been inspired by classical plays such as the Gaminon Tale by Seneca. Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, was killed by his wife, lover, after he returned from the Trojan War. Later, he is avenged by his son, Orestes, who killed his father and mother. The story of Hamlet by Shakespeare seems to be inspired by this tragic tale. Not only Hamlet, but also all the Renaissance plays could be inspired by this story, where the main character has the moral obligation to reverse relative who has been murdered. 
as for example the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd or the Revengers tragedy by Thomas Middleton. Language and Comedy Another one of the most outstanding characteristics in Renaissance English theatre is the use of an unrhymed iambic pentameter called blank verse, used by a great deal of authors, as Marlowe and Dr. Faustus. This kind of verse was inspired by the classical Latin verse which has no rhyme, and by a kind of Italian verse called versi sciolti that also contains no rhyme. Lots of scenic resources were borrowed from classical plays too, as the chorus in Romeo and Juliet or Dr. Faustus used to sum up the situation represented and to help the audience to follow the storyline. Another important element is the use of music and dance, very common in the Commedia dell'arte in Italy as well. There were also magic elements and supernatural characters in some plays, as fairies and pucks in Midsummer Night's Dream, where even classical characters appear, such as Theseus, Hippolyta or the King Zeus. Of course, all these characters were inspired by the classic mythology contained in Latin plays, or in Dr. Faustus, where the figures of Lucifer, Mephistopheles, or the seven deadly sins appear, represented physically as humans. The Tragic Comedy The Tragic Comedy is represented by Richard Edwards' Damon Amphitheus and George Whetstone's Promos and Cassandra. We find a similar plot in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. Shakespeare borrowed from Whetstone the organization of the action, especially the inclusion of a comic subplot. At that point, people started to write tragic comedy, breaking some of the classic rules. The Primitive English Tragedy – Seneca's Influence The Primitive English Tragedy started in universities with a group of university professors who started writing some literature for cultivated people. They were called University Wits. During the years 1551 and 1590, English stage life dominated by the influence of the Latin author of tragedy, Seneca, as can be appreciated in the most important tragedies of this period. First of all, Gubadoc by Thomas Norton and Thomas Shackbill, the first theatrical work to be based on the English Chronicles. Yocasta by George Gascoigne and Francis K. Wimersh. Gizmond of Salern. The Misfortunes of Arthur by Thomas Hughes and, Fra and Francis Bacon. And finally, The Spanish Tragedy by Thomas Gere. Seneca's Tragedy. Seneca is, indeed, the tragic Latin playwright who inspired to a bigger extent Renaissance authors. One of his most representative features was the fact that he used to show some violent scenes in his plays, such as battles or murders, where blood was a significant element. This kind of scenes were not usually represented in the stage by Seneca's time, however, this characteristic was quite striking for Renaissance writers and was taken by them. That is why, for example, it is shown how Hamlet kills Polonius. The plot of the typical revenge tragedy was always similar. A person in power kills another, whose relative feels moved to seek revenge. But, given the higher social status of the killer, this proves difficult. In, Sen in Seneca's tragedies, the monologues and speeches are very long and the action is nearly non-existent. These plays were not written to be performed, but to be residing in front of the emperor, in an atmosphere of violence and horror, which probably reflected Nero's court. Stoicism, which is Seneca's philosophical bent, is present as well. From his philosophy, we can extract his attitude versus death and revenge. Seneca divides his tragedies in five acts. The language. The resource introduced by Seneca was called Sihomia, in which the dialogue was placed in alternative rhyme lines. Speeches were meant to be declamatory rather than performed. The characters were always moved by violent passion. Seneca is interested in the development of ideas. The exaggeration of feelings in tragedy plays was another significant element in Seneca's tragedy taken by Renaissance authors. This feeling was especially love, often a main element in tragedies, the impossible love between two lovers who belong to a different social statements. The Argent of Faversham is one of the earliest examples of professional English plays. It entered the register of the Stationers' Company the 3rd of April 1592 and was printed later that year by Edward White. It is anonymous, though Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare, according to the names of some characters, have been contemplated as its possible authors. In the very beginning, we're shown the exposition of the scene. Arden has received several lands as inheritance from the Duke of Somerset. The stanza reflects some paradoxical implication throughout, and mostly the expression Veil of Heaven, which is translated into Spanish as Valle de Lágrimas. In the second stanza, Arden displays affliction to his friend Franklin because of the fact of his wife Alice and her lover Mosby sending letters to each other and appointing some encounters. The reply offered by Franklin comes to say that women are evil and manipulative. Arden implies in his response that no one's got the right to have a crush on someone else's wife. Arden also gives further details on his feelings towards Mosby, who he considers to be despicable, while fearing him to grow a bigger position.
He intends to kill Mosby to keep Alice's chastity. Franklin proceeds to convince Arden of treating her with good manners without any kind of jealousy. A few stanzas later, we appear to be introduced to one of the murderers of Arden, Shakeback, which shows off a great deal of bravery and lack of pity towards his forthcoming victim, taking advantage of the nocturne darkness. Scene 5, belonging to the third act, consists of a conversation between the two lovers, for Alice shows herself to be sorry for having ordered to kill Arden. Despite Mosby displays quite an empathic attitude towards her, the love seems to be fading away, and she begs him to forget about the relationship so as he could go back to her previous life. Alice puts all these words in the form of an enchantment. These interventions follow a Shakespearean influenced pattern regarding the silent language and the connection between the answers he provided. Mosby happens to adopt a defensive position and repents not having seen her with real eyes and invites her to go away. She counterattacks, saying that she was once warned by friends about the real personality of Mosby. The language used throughout the scenes displays great use of a perpetuum among the lines and within them. A huge assortment of devices is used, for instance when appealing to the dialogue between lovers, there we find some instance of parallelism. There can be appreciated as well some cases of words used in their literary forms, such as betwixt, which stands for between, or hapless, which means unlucky, or archaic forms, near, for never, nowest, nowest, and tis, which stands for it is.